Welcome back to the Social Kick Podcast. I'm Brian Lundquist. We got a full crew today, Luke Paddington, Justin Wynn, Dr. John Mullen, and a special guest today, a former brief teammate of mine <laughs> at Swim Mac in Carolina, uh, Carolyn Joyce. Carolyn, thanks for being on the show. Gosh, thanks for having me. I'm honored. Hey. We are honored to have you. Uh, and I guess uh, we're, well, first of all, we'll start on a, on, a, on a lighter note and then we're going to take it back toward a little heavier topic because that's what's happening in the world right now. But Carolyn, what are you drinking tonight? Um, well, I didn't know that it was happy hour because I just have, you know, I, I have a constant pint glass of water with me. I drink so much water every day. Um, and I also just finished a Peloton ride. I'm like super dehydrated, but um, yeah, water. <laughs> I've yet to do a Peloton ride. Uh, I work for a bicycle company, and so I'm usually riding outside, but I love riding inside of the trainer. I've also done, uh, what's the one, Soul Cycle with John's mm. wife before. So I feel like I would like it. It's all the rage. We've talked to some other people that are into it. So it's, it's like it brings out the, the best, but also like the worst qualities in me because it has like all of these metrics. Like you can, I, if you had a Peloton, I could follow you and I could see all of your rides. I could see your output. I could see your speed, your like everything. So like you want to get competitive, like definitely get on Peloton and um, it's really competitive. Well, that's like uh, Luke on Strava. He's stalking all our former oh, yeah. there, making yeah, sure they're getting 100 mile yeah. rides and stuff. Uh, <laughs> it's tough. Do you have any of your friends that are doing it with you that you are competitive? Yeah, with? there's like a lot of people. Um, so I, there's a bunch of swimmers that got Pelotons during quarantine. Um, I, I've ridden with Jacob Pebley, um, Ashley Twitchell is on it, Amanda Weir. Um, Christy Kowal, um, I I would have to look, but there's like uh, Brendan Hansen. Um, there's a bunch. Do you set up rides and uh, just I don't know arrange a time to say hey let's go ride together and then you're on at the same time or does it just happen? Um, I I haven't done that with any of the current swimmers. I've done it with some of my retired friends. Huh. Um, but it's like if so this is where Peloton gets really weird. If I go like right now and I'm like oh let me just go do a ride. And somebody that I follow has already done that ride. I can basically do the ride next to them and like be competitive with them. So um, yeah, it's, it gets really competitive. Leah Smith was on our show a couple of weeks ago and she talked about it. That's why she got into it. And I saw on Instagram that she was all trying to compete against Grievers. Um, and that shows like Leah's personality. Like I'm going to take Grievers down. <laughs> it was awesome. Dude, Grievers <laughs> put up a... Uh, Ridiculous number. He made us all proud. I bet. It's like a, awesome. in Mario Kart, in, on Mario Kart 64, <laughs> anyone play where you have like ghost mode and you have the yeah, ghost yeah, yeah. Gosh, love it. Love it. <laughs> I'm I ready to play Mario Kart 64 against anyone right here. Uh, here, <laughs> here. Probably take you in that too. <laughs> oh, oh, John's good. Talking <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of other people. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John, what are you drinking tonight? Yeah, I got a Bubble Stash IPA, tall boy. Bubble Stash, is that the brewery? Um, nope, it's a, it's a Hop Valley Brewery in uh, Eugene. Oh, I've never oh, heard of that. How is it? It's good, I've had it before. No oh, complaints. <laughs> That's, all right, it's good enough. <laughs> John, what are you drinking? Well, because I'm underage, water. No, I'm just yeah. I'm not underage. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, what you, you know, the monks make really good beer. So I said, but I didn't buy it because of that. I bought it because. Oh, bro. Uh, yeah. I, I never heard of it, but I, I fell for the marketing and it's pretty good. It's a hazy IPA, my usual. All right. All right. At least you've. You what? Luke, where'd you get that at? Uh, oh, my pizza place. Oh. But look oh. at the guy. The kid says, "Daddy, that's you." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> that <laughs> hair, the mullet. <laughs> that's, that's like spits. No. <laughs> <laughs> at least you deviated from your uh, simpler times, which is yeah. I feel like you're always drinking that. So um, I actually I don't know if I've ever told you guys this, but I'm drinking a, a regular Bud Heavy, which was the first beer that I ever had. Um, not gonna say how old I was, but oh, why not? I will. I can't say that I loved it. I went through a kind of a soft phase before I went back toward harder things after that. But yeah, I like it a lot. Anyway, okay. So uh, 
Social Kick is, uh, we started this whole thing uh, because we liked talking about topics that were happening in the swimming community and hap- things that were happening in our lives. And uh, so this is a weird week in the world um, and a difficult week because uh, there um, obviously is um, a lot of public outcry and uh, and rightfully so over racial injustice. And um, and it's, it's recognized not just in this country, but around the world. And I think that um, that's okay for us to talk about as a group of swimmers because these are our friends and these are the types of things that you would show up on the pool deck and talk about to each other. Right. And, and that's where you get perspectives from other people. And one of the things that I have so appreciated about the swimming community and my experience in it is that it's brought me perspectives from other people. It's brought me to other people and it's brought me to this forum where I can share a conversation with friends of mine that some of whom came from different backgrounds and some of whom look very much like me and came from environments just like I did. And, um, and, and swimming's not known as being a sport. It's definitely not a melting pot. Uh, and, um, and, and I feel that as though that has, is changing some yet it is a very privileged sport. Um, and like all of us that have found our way to the sport, I, 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 I maybe I'm being presumptive in this, but, Um, uh, many of us were found our way to it because of older siblings, our parents, the environment that we were in and the good fortune that we had to, um, uh, just to be involved in something and not everyone of every, uh, shape, size, color, orientation, et cetera, has the same types of, uh, you know, privileges, environment, circumstances, et cetera. And those shape our lives. Um, and I just think that that's one thing that in the swimming community, especially this week that I've been reflecting on going, hmm, uh, you know, what is it that leads to divides uh, that we have in the world? And what is it that leads to ways that we think about and treat one another? Um, and it's been it's been a weird uh, reflective time for me just to think about who do I have in my life? Who do I surround myself with and how does that shape my perspective? Um, and I most certainly just am aware at this point of, um, of, of, of a conversation of the, 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 I think swimming's a little behind, I'll just say it in inclusion and, uh, and openness toward, uh, a lot of different, uh, walks of life and perspectives. And that honestly, I think there's, there's a long way to go in that. So th- that's just what's been on my mind. And I don't know, I guess maybe I just wanted to invite, um, the, the group and, and maybe direct it to you, Carolyn, just to see like what's what's been going on mm-hmm. in your mind this week. Um, well, I, you know, like you, <clears throat> excuse me, like you said, it's been a very heavy week. Um, and I, I mean, like, look at us, Brian, we, you and I come from a pretty similar background. I can only imagine what this last week or two has been like for our our black friends and the people in our community and our country and what they are experiencing. I'm it's been tough for me, but I, you know, I can't even imagine what it's been like for other people. And I do think that you're right. You know, obviously swimming is uh, a very privileged sport. Um, just having access to water, being able to learn how to swim, um, whatever that environment is for you as a kid. Um, it, it, it's just predominantly white. And, um, you know, Maritza Caraya was the first black female Olympian for the United States. Like what? That was in 2004. And, um, and we were actually teammates at the time at Georgia. And it's, it's crazy to me to think that like in my lifetime and my, like, you know, I, I grew up idolizing many, many, Olympians, but in, you know, the time that I was on the national team is when we had our first black female Olympian. And, um, I can only hope that, um, whatever we all take away from, you know, everything that's happened in our country for the last couple weeks is that, you know, we move on to, uh, a better, more inclusive future period. Like there's no excuse not to. And, you know, I know you mentioned that you reflected on some things that, um, you can do better, Brian. And I've definitely done the same thing. I mean, I, I run a leadership summit for teenage girls swimmers and, you know, what are things that I can do? You know, we've 
definitely taken steps and, and we have, um, you know, made this an initiative of ours in the past, but like I can reflect on my actions in the last couple of years and like, it's not enough, Kara. Like you really can do more. And I think that's something that I, I had to be honest with myself about um, is, you know, how can I create an avenue? How can I be more inclusive to young black female swimmers? And um, and what does that look like for me? And, and what resources do I have? Or, um, you know, what resources can I tap into to help me grow um, you know, that base for us, because it's, it's important. And, um, and so that's something that internally, my team and I have been having conversations about all week. And, and it sometimes it hurts to like reflect on your actions and be like, man, I can do a lot better. Like it, it takes, uh, it takes a lot to get to that point. Um, but once you're there, it's like, okay, now what are the action steps and, and what are the things that we can do? So, um, I, yeah, I can, I can only imagine what this has been like for, um, you know, all of our peers that are experiencing this in real time, uh, you know, with their communities and, and, um, and yeah, I mean, I just, I want to do better and I want to be better. Yeah, it feels so. I mean, I, my sister's in town visiting, uh, which has been great to be able to connect with family. I live on the West coast. I'm from the East coast. And, um, you know, we were talking just about the, the fact that, like this isn't new though, you know, and it's not new to, especially to, to our black friends who have been um, living this and, um, or, or have you know, had things maybe more present in their mind than I do as a white person. And I, I think that, um, you know, if this to me, it, there's a, it, it maybe it's just cause it's the first real time in my lifetime. I mean, like there were some things that happened maybe six years ago with Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown. Um, but I mean, like, you know, maybe in my adult life at a more mature state, this is, it feels the most present and I see more activism and, and more of an uprising around, okay, this now's the time to do something about it. And um, I guess I just, um, I, I'm, and it's impacted me in maybe a different way than it has at other times, but I think it's not fair to, to think that like something's happening now that's new. It's not, right. it, you know, and it's, and it's not going to, it's not going to fix itself uh, immediately and it won't be fixed uh, even with all of us in, in the, in the near term. But um, yeah, it's definitely changed my perspective and, and, and thinking on it about, yeah, just really intrinsic. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe, maybe that's something that I'm thankful for as part of this is, and, and maybe a, 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 a good outcome is that as a society that um, maybe some people that haven't ha had it land with impact previously, that it does land with impact now and it influences introspection and, uh, you know, and change. So and action, absolutely. I agree. You know, it's good to hear you guys talking. And I think that's one way I've tried to, um, I've, in, I've, I've taken some solace this week is that we're starting to speak about, we meaning white people, are starting to speak about some of the things that we never really talked about before, about acknowledging the privilege that we have, about um, recognizing and seeing the systemic racism that's in that's in society. Um, because, you know, it, it was never really, especially not, let's talk, take back to our sport. How many sports have benefit more from privilege than swimming? Golf, perhaps? I mean, oh, access right. to facilities, elite country clubs for pools, um, it's it uh, only certain neighborhoods had pools. I'm going to back to Trinidad and Tobago where, I'm, where I grew up. Not many of us are white. One percent of the population is white. Um, we had four pools growing up. One of those four pools, the long course pool, was seen as a white club. Um, and, and that was the only long course pool in the country. Um, everybody swam. And everybody meaning all, all races swam. But who made the Olympics? Uh, six male Olympians for Trinidad and Tobago. Five of them are white. You know, um, why is that? Um, uh, yet, and, and we got told growing up, oh, um, blacks are too big boned. They're muscle bound. There's no way they're going to be good swimmers. And I got told that as an 11, 12 year old. So what are you doing, Carry of those young swimmers? It's, it's so important. And then one of my heroes showed up and I shook his hand. And I took a picture of him, Anthony Nasty. You know, he came, he, Anthony was born in Trinidad and he grew up in Suriname. And he won the first, he's the first black swimmer to win a gold medal. Um, there's actually, I just read actually today, there was a, a black swimmer from Holland who won bronze in the seventies to two German swimmers who eventually caught for doping. So that would have been the first gold medal, by the way. Um, so I was like, I, I always knew it was like, no, no, it's not, what are you talking about? 
So Anthony came, and then in 95 World Championships, show course Worlds in Gothenburg, first time ever two women were black made a, um, the World Championship final. Um, Leah Martindale and Siobhan Cropper. I was like, there you go. Next day in Atlanta, Leah Martindale, first female to make the final of 50-meter freestyle. There you go. I kept saying, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. Leah and Siobhan are my friends, mine. And then, as you, as you mentioned, and then, and then Tony. Tony is the first um, African-American to make the U.S. Olympic team. And what do you do? in 2000 and then what do you say about uh, about uh, sorry, in, in 2004 and and so i was just like what does it take to to end to end this and, and 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 i think it's just i'm so glad that we're talking about it and we're acknowledging it and we're seeing it and and, and we know it and and um i think that's what we need to do just to like know it and stand stand with them i think stand with people we we, we can't relate to but we can see you know yeah Definitely. And, you know, with swimming, you know, when I've been consulting either with Trinidad or with India, you know, mm -hmm. to keep it within the sport of swimming here, it's just access. Like you said, that's one yeah. of the biggest things. And um, I was talking with this coach in India and it was, OK, people can't get get to the water. They can't learn how to swim at early enough age. And that's that's a huge barrier there. So yep. there's tons of things that need to be done. And like you guys said, this is a, a big issue, not just in America, but all over the world. And, you know, trying to improve our own um, or reflect upon ourselves and see what we can to do, not only now, but hopefully throughout time here to continue to get better and improve. I know as a business owner, we're taking steps to see what we can do to obviously keep the um, keep everything in perspective within the business, but also see what we can do for the community and continue to, to work and, and get better for everyone. I love that our sport is objective. I've always loved that it comes down to the work you put in. If you're, if you're afforded the ability to do work, the work that you put in, you, you see out of our sport and nobody judges you, you, how hard you work is what time you touch that wall. It's based on time. I love that objectivity of sport. I always have. Um, but at the same time, when, when it comes to picking of national teams, there's, there, there's political biases there, there's racial biases there on the non-US teams at least. So, you know, I, I, it's, we have a great sport where we can achieve if we're given the opportunity, we meaning human race. And, we, and that's how we, Simon is doing such wonderful things right now, the opportunities and Leah. Um, so I'm, I'm blessed we have the sport, but at the same time, the sport needs to continue to be opened up. And what Jim Ellis did in Philadelphia in the 70s and 80s and now, more of that needs to be pushing. The YMCA program, fantastic. You know, and what we do is going out to the communities and teaching them. And Cara, what you're doing with, with LEAD and, and what we go out to our clinics, that needs to happen more. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think with swimming and like a lot of things, it's not just the swimmers. It, it can go all the way up to, you know, coaching staffs and things like that, too. I know, yep. Luke, you said like in the U.S. it's very objective with times, but that's on the swimmer side. And there is many different levels right. of this whole environment. I mean, Who's the head coach? Of, Anthony is now the head coach of, of UF, right? And, and so that's really good. And Leah Martindale is now the head coach at Tulane or Rice, who's now, um, which is great. How many African Americans, how many blacks are coaches at the NCAA level? Um, you know, how many of them have, have, have gone, have gone, uh, excelled in, in, in coaching or even administration? You know, who's the head of US swimming? Who's the head of, of FINA? Uh, and let's talk about how FINA runs the sport and, and where they're putting their funding and their money. And where's, where's, where's that investment going? Where are those programs going beyond the, the U.S., the Australia, the England? The, you had the powerhouses we're talking about, you know, so that, where is that going? So it's a big discussion and a lot to go. But I think the first step is, is we're talking about it and seeing it. Yeah? Definitely. Okay. And it's something I think, you know, we're, we're talking about it now, but we all need to be more educated yeah. about Correct. it and learn more about it just because, um, obviously these are important issues and, and hopefully this time has taught us all that we need to learn more about it and, and make changes. Well, I think one of the great things about the time that we share together is getting to hear from each other and hear each other's perspective and the way each other thinks. And just whether it's this topic or any other topic, I get to learn from you, John, from you, Justin, from you, Luke, about like your lives and the way you think about things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everybody having some openness toward that is uh, is yep. generally the the way that we all grow, uh, regardless of, of the topic. So. Um, and now today we get to learn from Kara and her perspective. <laughs> so Kara, I'm wondering actually uh, what was going on in your mind when you were doing this? So. <laughs> oh man. 
Um, probably, <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> I think Justin was wondering, is that, uh, you know, the most hydrodynamic um, cap positioning? Well, that's that's mid cap put on. Oh, got it. Uh, it was freezing cold or really hot. I bet you it was freezing uh, cold. It was both. So this, uh, okay, some backstory. <laughs> this um, was shot in uh, Glenwood Hot Springs. So right outside of Aspen, Colorado. Oh, nice. And I think it was in um, March. So there was snow on the ground, but these are, it was a natural hot spring and you guys being swim nerds would love this pool. Um, it's probably like a hundred years old and it's all stone carved into um, this like hot spring area. And the water is, is sulfur water. It's, there's no chlorine in it or anything like that. Oh. And you can literally open your eyes underwater um, without any pain. Right. Um, I, I did like yoga underwater and like water was going straight up my nose, no pain, like nothing um, at all. And so that was for Joe Lynn um, a couple years ago. We, we did that shoot together, but yeah, that's, that's mid cap put on. <laughs> you just described like, I haven't swum in three months in my 45 years on this planet. I have never been out of water for more than a week. You yeah. Describe like heaven. <laughs> yeah, you guys should. Oh my gosh, you're, if you're ever in that area, if you're in Denver, um, anytime you should check that place out. It is so amazing, and it's a 50 meter pool. I didn't even mention that. It's a 50 meter like stone carved in natural hot spring pool. Really? Like, there, it's crazy. The only thing I know of that's even remotely of that description, I was picturing lakesides, yep. uh, cool, but that sounds way, 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 way better. Oh, so. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, similar. Um, well, that's a cool memory in a pool. I wanted to ask you about what we ask a, a lot of guests, which is, what do you remember about your last swimming race? Oh, my gosh. Well, um, my last swimming race, oh, it's, I don't know if it's like ironic. I don't think it's ironic. It's probably the, the wrong word to describe it. But um, so my last race was in the London Olympics. And so that was 2012. Um, it was like a miracle that I even made that Olympic team. Um, so like, if you ask my favorite race, it would be like qualifying for, um, oh God, <laughs> is that what I went? <laughs> is that really what I went? Jeez. This is your life. <laughs> um, okay. So like making that team was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. But like, once I got to London, I was so tapped on, like energy, emotion. I mean, I, I didn't have like a lot left in the tank and I was like, just like try to get a second swim, Kara, you know, like it was the end of my career and I knew it. And I'd never, I had never known when I was going to retire or when that, when that time would come. And, um, when I was in the ready room at Olympic trials in 2012, about to walk out for the 50 free, um, I was like having these like mixed thoughts in my head. I'm like, do I, um, thank you. More <laughs> do I, Get I was like, thinking, like all these negative things. I'm like, I like, Oh, like I, I feel sorry for myself. You know, how am I supposed to do this? 53. Like I, I had such a bad back injury these last couple of years. And like, I had all these coaching changes and I was like thinking about all these things that had gone wrong. And I was like, what am I doing? Like, why would I think all of these like negative thoughts? I, I have been swimming for 21 years. And if I know anything, it's that like, you have to think positive if you're going to actually have a good race. If, if you don't believe in yourself, like it doesn't matter. Like your coach can believe in you. Your parents can believe in you, your teammates, your friend, like everyone can be like, well, you could do it. But if you don't actually think that you can do it, it's not going to happen. And I was like, okay, Kara, like think positive, think positive. What do you got? And I thought about um, when I was seven years old and I, I was sitting on the bed and I was watching uh, the Olympics, the 1992 Olympics on TV for the first time. And I was like, mom, like, what is like swimming on TV? What is this? And, you know, like every little kid, you kind of learn what the Olympics are when you see them for the first time. And I was like, well, I want to go to the Olympics someday. I want to do that. And I thought about when I was in fifth grade, I had uh, a big poster board. Um, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to be an Olympic swimmer when I grow up. And I thought about getting out of bed at five o'clock in the morning and jumping into an ice cold pool. And um, like all of these thoughts came across my mind and I was like, what? Like, this is why I'm doing this. Like all I have to do is go out and swim one more 50 free. Cause this is probably the end, Kara. Like you've hit the end of the road and um, done everything that like, I felt like I took my talent and like, like 
took every last drop and wrung it out. And I was like, this is probably going to be my last swim. And honestly, I'm probably good enough for fourth place, but I'm going to be really proud of that. And I'm just going to go out and give it my best effort and, and then call it a career. And so, um, I think like once I took the pressure off of like actually making the team and it wasn't about like, you have to get first or second, you have to make the Olympics. It was about, you just have to go and honor that seven year old girl who wanted to be an Olympian. And the person that worked her butt off for 20 years to get here, you honor that and you give it your best effort. Like that's all you got to do. And I was so happy, like walked out behind the blocks. I'm like, <laughs> like this is so fun. And, um, and I got second place and, and it was a big, like, it was my, it was a big learning experience for me. Um, so the shock of like, oh my gosh, like I actually made it. And then the second wave hit me, like, well, I'm still in the water looking at the screen and I'm like, wait, I have to keep swimming for another four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Did not plan that. So swimming at the Olympics, um, Everybody, you know, all three of my different journeys, like they have a, their own story and, and London in particular, I, I was just so lucky to be there. And um, I learned a lot from that experience, but that swim, so I swam prelims, I guess I went 25, eight, like that is so bad. Um, and I remember like, I walked through the mix zone and I, I'm crying cause I'm like, man, I'm, I just finished my career. Like going, I, I didn't even, I don't even think I looked at the clock. I knew it was that bad of a race. And I get in the warm down pool and like my goggles are just filling up with tears and um, I'm about to do a turn and I feel a tap on my head and I look up and it's coach Troy, Greg Troy from Florida. He's like, KLJ, you tied for 16th. You got to swim off. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, like, I'm already mourning the end. Never I'm, ending like, story. I'm, I'm like, I'm like in mourning, like, just let me, let me like drown in my misery right here. Um, but like, you know, I swim the 50 free my entire career and I, I cannot recall ever doing a swim off in the 50 free ever. Wow. Um, and so here I am at the Olympics, I three-way tied for 16th. So I three-way tied for the, um, you know, like a semifinal position. And, and so that was my last swim. I did a swim off. I got second, the girl that won the swim off. Um, she was from England, so it was like really cool. And then she swam in semifinals and actually made finals and everything. Oh, and, um, she did our, our heat of swim off justice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was my last race was a, a swim off at the Olympics. Wow. What's it like to do a swim off at the Olympics? I mean, cause I think about swim offs and it's like the crowd has sort of fizzled and the yes. teams aren't on deck anymore. But you're it's, not, and they, it's not in the schedule. So the officials are like, but aren't we going to lunch? Like what? got another okay okay fine and they have to like reconfigure the pool again and and so i think it was like over an hour from the time the session ended until my actual swim off and i my entire family is there um there's probably 12 people from like team oh joyce my. there and they all got booted out of the arena like nope session's over you have to leave and they're trying Lord. to like, like oh but she's got a swim off and so they had to wait outside for however much time. And then they were allowed to come back in. Everybody's allowed to come back in to watch it. But um, yeah, so the stands are like kind of empty. I, so I could really hear, you know, everybody that was there for me. Sure. Um, but yeah, it, it was just like such a surreal um, ending, I guess. Um, but yeah. So Amy Smith didn't have any home field advantage, basically. Because there's nobody oh, is that, is that who it was? Yeah. There's no home field advantage because nobody in the crowd to watch her, which is must have been a bumming for her. Mm. Oh, yeah. But what was the um, you know, I remember my last race and my best part, the best part of my last race, the worst part I saw like shit, but the best part was I saw against my brother for the first time ever and I see our two names on the boards and oh, he beat me. And that, that was that was really great, right? I look back at that now. What was the best part about your last race? That's from us. Was it something somebody said? Was it a look? Was it I don't know. What, what well, was at the really time, cool? I mean, if you ask me at the time, Brother Luke, there was yeah. nothing good about it. Like, I was so upset. Um, I felt like I let them, my country down. I'm like, yeah. oh, my yeah. gosh, you know, yeah. Christy Magnuson got third at Olympic yeah. trials. I'm sure she would have loved the opportunity to swim. Yeah. That Like, I had a lot of um, just a lot of guilt. And I, I think it's yeah. it's hard to really sort your emotions when you have, you know, you just retired from something and sort of unexpectedly but also like you kind of knew, like it was just a lot to to take in and um 
we had a team meeting. So between prelims and finals of the Olympics, um, before you head off to finals, the entire team has a meeting and you talk about prelims, all the races, you talk about, you know, what's to come, if there's relays and, um, and they acknowledge all the swims from prelims. And I remember like sitting there being like, and Terry McKeever was the coach. I'm like, please yeah. Terry, do not acknowledge my 50 free. Do not acknowledge my 50 free. And she's like, and, and now we're going to talk about, you know, Carolyn's 50 free this morning. And I'm like, oh God. <laughs> and I just started like bawling and, and, um, I, it was just too much, too many emotions. And after the team meeting, I, I walked over, I remember kind of like hanging my head. I walked over to Terry and coach Troy and, um, and David Marsh. And they were like, Hey, we're really proud of you. Like yeah. you, you put it all out there and we're really proud of you. And like that, like breathed like air into my lungs. I was like, okay, like I, I can, I can walk out of here with my chin sort of high and, and know that, you know, at least I, I gave it my best effort. You guys, I have never reflected on that race. <laughs> I've never talked about. about that. And I guarantee you that we speak to some rookie on that team in 2012, and they're going to say, uh, let's go back one second. Do you know what it takes to make the Olympics? In, like, if there are 100 people in the world, one makes the Olympics. Of those one, you know how hard it is to make the Olympics for the U.S.? So, I don't know, less than one. In in an in individual event, not a relay, I don't know. And then to do it again, uh -huh. and then again. So you are three-time Olympian, 27 years old, in the 50 meter freestyle, one of the baddest ass sprinters in the world. <laughs> and so some 2012 freshman probably has looked at that swim off and will tell us a story now on our next podcast about it. I'm, I guarantee. And yeah. that's where you can come away from. That's why they're proud of you because you stood up there and you just raced. You did yeah. it. And what a way to end a storied career. I mean, you couldn't yeah. write that story, right? A three-way yeah. swim off at the Olympics. It's I, like, who, I never, that's not, you know, I, I don't know how we all envision like our send off, like Michael Phelps style. We're going to win a gold medal and break a world record. And, you know, like into the distance, like it doesn't really happen that way, but how lucky am I, you know, like at the end of the day, I'm so freaking lucky that, um, that I got to the opportunity to, to swim until I called it a day exactly. and a lot of people most people i don't think get to end their careers on their own terms yeah. and um and so i feel really fortunate that you know as as crazy emotional as that last race was like i was so freaking lucky to be there should we wow. judge swimming to the thousands of the second or should we continue i don't think so um i i actually had dinner with um one of the founders of dactronics oh. who um He's like in his late eighties, I want to say. And I specifically talked to him. Oh no, no, no. He, um, he's actually the reason that we stopped doing times to the thousandth. And I think it was, there's too much, um, the margin for error between, um, if a block, if a starting block is like a millimeter behind another starting block, if water gets behind the touch pad, um, cause you know, sometimes you can get like that rush of water. And so, um, Hearing it from him, he sent the petition to FINA and they, they stopped um, doing it to the hundredth, to the thousandth. No, it, it makes sense. We we, we had Milo Kavik on the show a few weeks or months ago. Yeah, that's and, a good question um, for Milo. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it was, if I had a question. Um, and and, and, and in afterwards, we were talking about, there was an instance of, um, do you remember this, this post I sent you guys about how do you to judge swimming based on place judges? And I had that when I was age group swimmer. You had eight judges who are the finish line who overrule time is and they're the ones who determine who came first second first of who touched it and they overruled it so if there was if, if oh, you threw away the, the oh, oh. time and you threw away the slowest time and you had a middle time and if those times tied it was the place judges and it's so easy to see a finish right isn't it <laughs> so yeah brian you don't remember that article one of the ten thousand articles luke sent in the slack channel <laughs> <laughs> I need to get in the Slack channel. Luke sends about 10 articles. We shoot these at 6, between 5 and 6 p.m. He sends at least 10 articles and videos. Guys, must watch, right? <laughs> hey, it's me, okay? <laughs> no, I didn't catch that. But I think, well, we're probably, I mean, it's a good question because we're probably not far away from going back that direction. Like the, the technology and, and yeah. the world has changed a whole lot, right? Even in the last 10 years. And I mean, I don't know. I um, Wait, what I, did Kevin say? I actually want to know. Hmm. We didn't get into it specifically with him about okay. the, the thousandth. 
Well, so I think I've heard mm-hmm. other conversations with him or heard through George about his perspective on it. The, I mean, the, and from his coach, uh, cause I had trained with Andrea for a little while who was coaching him. And the perspective that I've always heard is that he actually touched the wall first, but he didn't touch it with enough pressure. And there's a certain amount of pressure that can set off the touch pad. And so yeah, pretty light then. Yes. Oh, well it was, I mean, he was looking up, right. Um, but he still had a lot of momentum. Like you look at, you know, little like six and unders, eight and unders that yeah. can hit the touch pad. And, and he was, regardless if his head came up or not, he was had the momentum of a 50 point long course speed. And mm-hmm. um, so I have actually heard that um, the Colorado timing system, whatever they do use the computer, like those people sitting at the computer on the side of the pool that actually reads to the thousand. So there are very select few people in this world that know what the thousandth on that race said. No, they have the proof, and he did touch it first. It's oh just, really? Yeah, the photograph is there, but he did. No, it's not just the photograph. They have the data. It's just he didn't. He didn't touch it with yeah. enough pressure, and there's a certain amount of pressure to register the timing. So, but it like the rules are that you have to touch it with enough pressure, and. He's accepted that. I mean, you can tell how many years later when we're talking to him, he's so much more mature and he sees it different, yeah. differently now. It's, it's great, his perspective, you know, head coach of King and all. You um, know, but track does a, a photo finish. Why can't no. we do that? Or like soccer has a sensor. So when the ball crosses the line and score a goal, it's down to the millimeter. I mean, right. we can start well, this somehow. I don't know. Well, I mean, we, still have, we still have problems of currents and pools, though. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they are. I mean, that was the final. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, so the, the thing, well, the thing that over, it really impacted me that Milo was so pumped about his silver medal though. I mean, yeah. he was so joyed about the fact that he earned an, a silver medal and he was in the race with, you know, with Michael and he was there representing his country and all this. And um, I don't know, that's, that's the thing that he shared with us about what he remembered about that race. And that really box surgery. Surgery. Yeah. He saw the positive side of it. Yeah. Like, knowing that he yeah, kind of, kind of one i don't know so yeah speaking of great ties i recently watched the 2000 was it 1600 fly when there was a three-way tie for second with phelps and laszlo and um yeah uh, yep yeah, yeah, and uh and laclo man yeah. what a great tie that was yeah was yeah cute. yeah it's like you know <laughs> Um, so I wanted to ask you, Carolyn, what, what are the things that you think that, so for uh, maybe I'll tell a story and I still tell people this today and it's, I don't know, like I only got to swim with you for six months maybe, but I saw you, oh, it was only three months. So, um, but I got, I was high school friends with a bunch of people that swam at Georgia that overlapped with you when you were there, when I was at Auburn. You came and visited us a couple of times, didn't you? Uh, yeah, no, I totally did. I almost transferred to Georgia. So I was this close, but then I ended up swimming fast. The commitment I made to myself my freshman year, I was going to transfer to Georgia. And I said, okay, I, if I swim fast at SECs, I'm not going to transfer. No. And then I swam like all best times at SECs. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I got to stay. Like, this is something. And then I yeah. stayed. But so like you and I were the same class, right? We definitely partied at some point at Georgia. Oh, yeah. Well, I was friends definitely with people that love to party in Georgia. <laughs> um, but uh, so, but during our brief time together, one of the things that totally struck me is how good, how like a crazy good of a puller you are. <laughs> I'm maybe, it's because, oh maybe it's because I'm also a terrible puller, but you crushed people in pulling. So I'm curious to know what it is that from your perspective, you, like made you really good at pulling. Well, or no, just in general, like I, that's what I saw of you, but I didn't of course think it was just the pulling. Like there's a lot of things, yeah. about, you know, every, but no, you recognizing my pulling, like I've had dreams where I'm competing in like the 300 pole at the Olympics. <laughs> like I can't even tell you how much like pulling means to me. <laughs> so yeah, I got it. Okay. I, <laughs> yeah, I have like a weird um, backstory for kind of how I got uh, really good at pulling. But um, basically, I started training with um, the University of Michigan men's team. Um, so it was like Club Wolverine from 
like March or April to August. And um, so after my sophomore year of high school, my family moved to Michigan from New York so that I could train with um, John Urbanchek and the U of M men. Um, And so I, I swim in lane five every day and my training partner was Tom Malchow. He was in lane four. Does this even um, legal? Yeah, yeah, sure, it's legal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it wasn't, so I, I didn't swim with them between September and um, NCs. Like I would swim with my high school team, um, you know, August to November. I would swim with a club team for three months and then I would um, train with, okay. yeah, with um, the Michigan men. And so um, really early on when I first got there, I was like maybe 15 and, uh, I was, I remember being like really intimidated, but I think like something kind of weird, um, like you, you have like some X factor when you're young, right? Like, and if you like tap into it at the right time, you can like open up this like whole new like wormhole of possibilities. And so um, it was like maybe the first like month or two that I was training with C-Dub and just getting decimated. And like, I love training, like I love training middle distance. I will throw down with anybody. And, um, but, but pulling specifically, I'd never worn paddles before. And these guys were crushing me. And it's like, you know, like back in the heyday, kind of with like Tom Malchow, Chris Thompson, um, like Peter Vanderkay and Davis were there. Yeah. Um, wow. just like a lot of like really good Dave, uh, Dan Ketchum, a lot of really wow. good, um, swimmers at the time. And, so like, you know, they give me these yellow paddles, like stroke maker, classic yellow paddles. And I, I have naturally like pretty big hands. And the first time I put them on, I'm like, you know, like a dog with shoes trying to walk. And um, one day I remember like we had this crazy set. It was like 400s long, everything was long course at Cobalt Brain, but it was like 400s long course. Um, and I want to say they like, it was on five minutes. 450, 440, 430, do that all over again, or something like that. And I was like, I am going to make the interval on this day if it kills me. And this is like that X factor. Like I pulled so hard, like I couldn't feel my arms. And um, and I freaking made the interval. And I was like, okay, like I am never gonna go back to being a bad puller again. Um, and so like the things that happened after that, like you guys. So this one time, you'll appreciate this story. This one time I was in um, Hawaii, I was on a training trip with um, the UCLA women's team. So back when Kim Vandenberg swam for UCLA, Cindy Gallagher was the head coach. And um, it was like after, um, I think it was 2008, after NCAAs. So like I, you know, didn't compete at NCs and um, the whole team was taking that week off or something. And, And she's like, why don't you come to Hawaii and train with UCLA for a week? Um, Eric Vent is coming too. And she and Eric were dating at the time. Right. And I'm like, okay, great. That sounds cool. And I remember like Cindy kept putting me in Eric's lane and he would have a different workout from the rest of the UCLA women. And people were like, oh, Kara, what's the hardest set you've ever done? Or like the hardest, I'm like, it is freaking Cindy Gallagher's set in Hawaii with Eric Vent. So it was, I'm gonna, let me make sure I get this right. <clears throat> it was all short course and it was pulling. It was a a 200 on two minutes, a 400 on four minutes, a 600 on six minutes, an 800 on eight minutes, an 800 on eight minutes, a 600 on six minutes, a 400 on four minutes, a 200 on two minutes. So it was 4,000 yards all on the minute base. Stop. Just... And on the way up the ladder, you would go like cruise the 200 on two minutes, um, <laughs> work the 400 on four minutes, cruise the 600 on six minutes, work the 800 on um... eight minutes. And so I'm like cruising, like, you know, like uh, a 157, 200, like dear God. And then like, we would bust it for like the next thing. So like the 400, I'm going like 345 or something like that to get 15 seconds rest. Like it is the craziest set I've ever done, but I'm like, okay, you know, like I fancy myself a good puller. Like I am going to make this set with Eric Vent and it is still to this day, the hardest set I've ever done, but it goes back to like Malchow, like being my training, like he was such a good puller too. And, um, and learning like how to do that at an early age, I'm telling you, like, if I didn't learn that at 15, I never would have um, been able to pick it up like that. But like, you know how, like you're watching, like 
I don't know, these young kids like Gretchen Walsh or something like that. And you're like, well, they're young. Like they can literally do anything. Like they have the X factor right now. And, and we don't know what they're capable of. And I feel like when you're young, like you have to tap into that in your swimmers um, to get like crazy stuff out of them. But how, how does that translate into four NCAA titles in the 50? It doesn't at all. Like the- my pulling did not help. <laughs> No, that, that's the like, to though. counter that, like however good of a puller I was, I was like the worst freaking kicker on the team. Um, actually, Katie Hoff, she's Katie Hoff is coming out with a book soon, and um, oh, wow. I don't want to do any spoilers, but she references like a like a historic pull set that she and I did together at Olympic training camp in two thousand eight, and I think it was like twelve twos long course on two twenty pull. And we're going like 200, 201. And both of us are trying, like, coming into the wall, like, <clears throat> like don't show weakness, don't breathe hard, don't let the other one know that, oh, like, yeah. <laughs> I'm, like yeah. and like, as soon as I push off the wall, I'm like, <clears throat> okay, like, now I can catch my breath just so I can't, like, <laughs> She's uh, coming on the show soon, so we're gonna bring up that story with her for sure. Bring up that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, so Kara, I wanted to, head pulling. I wanted to, to to play this video here because big up our friend um, Glenn Mills, who is this oh, awesome yeah. sport, right? So we all know Kara's swim stroke from above the water because it's it's absolutely beautiful. The high elbows, just a smooth recovery, and just you know, really even. But when I saw this video for the first time, I saw you underwater. And I was just blown away at your catch. And I, I, anybody who's watching this show, please tune in and watch her underwater, her catch, her so much power you got right there. Look at that. That power is, is jerking right now, but I encourage you watching afterwards. The power you have is incredible. And then we all remarked on this. We didn't realize how wide your catch was. Talk about that. Mm-hmm. Was that planned? It was, I mean, you got pure muscle, yeah? The strike. Full screen that video, by the way. Come on, man. What? <laughs> You worked in multimedia, full screen. That <laughs> I don't work in streaming, okay? I'm I, I'm not gonna. Full... All right, hold on. Need binoculars to see that. Jeez. Oh, come, look here. There we go. Try that out. See, <laughs> what Try I have to do. Oh, now it's gone. So no. Get out of so, yeah, it. I, but, it's that's gone. A good question, because right. I actually um that we filmed that go swim um gosh, 2000 December of 2008, I think. No, it was December 2007. Um, so it was after like NC's my senior year. And Brian, you're going to appreciate this. But um, do you remember Gretchen Corliss? Oh, yeah, totally. It was like her 21st birthday, like the day before I had to film that. Oh, and God. so you're like, of course, you know, like we oh. celebrated appropriately. And I had to film like I swear Glenn had me in the pool for like 18 hours the next day. And I'm like, you don't know. <laughs> What my life is like, Glenn. You don't know what I went through. <laughs> you could, could um, probably smell it on you. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. Why he did it. <laughs> when. <laughs> um, but so you asked if my, I actually get a lot of questions because um, that video, Glenn plays that a lot. And it's, I guess it makes like some top 10 lists of his every year. Half um, million views. But I think the video quality, like being in the, the contrast of the dark uh, diving tank at Georgia um, and, and my glowing white skin uh, makes the, the video like, it makes it really clear so people actually like can watch the the catch a little bit easier i guess but a wide pull um yes for anything like 200 and up and then it gets more narrow um for like a 50 and 100 but i, I get that question a lot is that a conscious uh, okay. change or that's just more with the stroke rate change i think you can generate more power with a more narrow pull um and then you can pull more from like your core strength, like your rotation and everything with a wider catch. Um, but yes, uh, conscious change. Yeah. Did that start from the seeds that your mom planted in technique? Like, where do you think that that started? No, um, you guys, I'm like, I'm such a swim nerd. Like I'm kind of jealous that you have this podcast where you get to talk about swimming so um you come back. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're on we need you. like let's talk about people's no well, um, i'm ready to kick luke out anytime we're ready yeah. <laughs> i um this is so i i think i learned how to be a student of the sport when i when we moved to michigan and i started training with like a, a pool full of olympians like some of the greatest swimmers of our, our time and Um, I remember like, okay, like just be a sponge, absorb, absorb, absorb. What can you learn? And and John Urbanchek is actually a great, um, 
technician and um, he definitely taught me what high elbow catch was um, at a pretty young age. But my career as um, a national team athlete and this, I don't know if this is weird or not, but um, you know, I swim the 50 free at every single international meet I ever raced in sometimes the hundred um, almost never the 200, but always the 50 and the 50 is on the last day of mm -hmm. like a, a five day world championships an eight day Olympics, like whatever it is, the 50 is the last day. And I would sit in the stands and analyze every single person's stroke. I like know everyone's times from like my day. I know when they went their best times. Like it, I'm like, unfortunately that's what's taking up my brain space yeah. and not Same. actual valuable information that I can make, you know? Um, but I, I definitely started to really be like a studious swimmer at around like 15, 16 and figure out like how, how these people can move through the water so much better than me, so much faster than me. And like, what can I do to mimic them? So we have a game that we play called Olympic game where we're given like, you know, four 200s on three minutes and we're, we're to a, like an Olympic year and we had a name and we have to tell you what time that person went in that Olympic final. And we did that a couple of times and we got down always to the 10th, sometimes to the hundredth of the second or some like random finalists. So wow. I would love to have you on that game. We have yeah, that. yeah, count me so in. Carolyn, I noticed in your streamline, you do something that I do as well when I swim. And Brandon and I, we, we once talked about this a lot. Did John ever try to make you, so you always start your stroke of your right hand, right? You always dive in here, mm -hmm. but you put your right hand on top. Yes. On your streamline. And I had a couple of coaches try to get me to switch, try to get me to start my left or switch it up. And I just couldn't do it. Just like you can't, I remember Mike Lewis, um, the photographer, tried to get me to flip turn and look to my other side. And I'm like, I, I can't, I can't flip yeah. turn and turn to the other side. It's impossible. And I look like a, like a 12 year old. <laughs> so has anybody ever tried to change that technique? And what do we think about, you know, you're streamlining of, of that. So those who don't understand, you're streamlining like that, but then this hand comes off and starts to stroke as opposed to what would one thing like this. Yeah. Anybody, John mentioned that, anybody talk about that? No. And I, I remember always hearing like, you want to pull with your bottom hand. You want right. to pull with your bottom hand. And so for me, if like, you know, this is the surface of the water, I'm like, oh, they obviously mean the hand that's closer to the bottom of the pool, not the bottom hand of my streamline. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> but, good one, I think. You know, never something that I, um, that I tried to like mess with, but I remember when I was like, uh, maybe like 12 or 13, I was really bored in practice. And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna start flipping the other direction. No. And so um, I'm like the only freestyler that flips. And so every other wall, I'm like eye to eye with whoever I'm racing, like pushing off <laughs> and looking at them. Yeah, I, right. I flip the other way. That's so hard, no. Yeah, oh, I do think that, that more people should try it because I do think most people have a side to side preference. Yeah, and I don't think they realize what it is. And I think it's one of those things just like with the hand position. There's so much like mis people call it in the PT world misplaced precision where it's like you focus on like one thing and it's like, does this really make that much of a difference? Yeah. Probably yeah. not. There's I, so I, other I things. To focus think, on. Yeah. I don't think it does. And, um, you know, I, I, so I coached, um, private lessons for like four or five years at, um, a swim school called swim labs. And this was like my like super nerdy, like I was living my best life because, um, I wasn't teaching learn to swim. I was teaching, um, competitive swimmers how to swim faster. And so they would swim in an endless pool and I'm, I'm not in the water. I'm on the outside. And I have a camera in front, I have a camera on the side, I have a camera above, and then I have a big wow. monitor. So I can analyze their stroke. And inside um, the TV, I have an entire library of like hundreds of um, Olympians and like great swimmers doing drills, swimming in the Olympics, like whatever it is. So I can get some, you know, maybe like cocky 14 year old boy to come in and be like, well, what are you gonna tell me about my stroke? And I'll be like, well, like, first of all, let's put you next to like, you know, I don't know, Michael Phelps or Brian Lundquist or whoever. Um, so you can see all the things, but yeah, uh, I love like analyzing technique. I love talking about technique. Um, and it was like one of my favorite jobs that I've ever had. You're in the right space. What are some of the things that you picked up from, I mean, shoot, gosh, the coaching tree that you've been impacted by is insane. Uh, I don't know your mom. I'm sure that was a huge, like <laughs> huge foundation, but I mean, to be around her and then Jack, Jack and Harvey and then 
David Marsh and others like, <laughs> and of course, all the national team coaches throughout that have been yeah. part of the network that you've been able to soak up like a sponge, all the things. I'm sure what started in you at age 15 and 16 never went away throughout your swimming career. It was a huge part of your success. So like, I don't know, as your career went on, what do, what do you think are some of the things that you picked up and started to really do well? Because even at 15, you weren't like world beating and then like that changed a lot and you continue to improve. Um, I am... I am so lucky. Like, I don't know how I got as lucky as I did to have, like, it's like the trifecta, right? It's like Urbanchek, Marsh, and Bowerly, or mm -hmm. like throw Carol Capitani in there, throw Harvey in there. Mm -hmm. um, I got to work with so many great coaches. Um, and I, I'm like forever eternally grateful for that. And they all had like really impactful, um, you know, just were very impactful for my career. And even somebody like David Marsh, who I swam with for three months was like tremendously impactful for me. Um, but Brian, you know, I, so a little bit of backstory. I swam at Georgia, Brian and I are the same year. Um, going into like recruiting in high school, I, um, I had gone on a national junior trip with um, Kim Bracken. She was one of the coaches. And I was like, I am swimming for Auburn. I know this already. I don't even need to go on my recruiting trip. Like I am an Auburn girl through and through. That's where I'm going to go. And, you know, I scheduled my recruiting trips and I'm like, I'll just be nice. I only took three trips because I was so certain that Auburn was the one for me. And I took a trip to Michigan um, because I was right there. I knew that, you know, just really it was actually a great trip. <clears throat> and then I took a trip to um, Auburn and then I took a trip to Georgia. Uh -huh. And Within, I don't know, two minutes of being at Auburn, I was like, this is not the place for me. Like, mm -hmm. I cannot go here. And it wasn't anything about the people. It wasn't anything about, like, Auburn itself. But it was just that feeling in my gut. Like, I have been wrong this whole time. And I'd never been to Auburn before as I'm in high school. Like, obviously, I've never even been to the South, um, thinking that Auburn's the place for me. And then the next weekend um, – and I'm in my head. I'm like, I need to plan more recruiting trips. I need to, to go see other places. Um, the next weekend I took my recruiting trip to Georgia mm -hmm. and the exact same feeling within two minutes, I stepped on campus and it was like the clouds parted like, ah! and I was like, Oh my gosh, like this is, this is the place for me. This is where um, I need to go. And so for my four years of college swimming, um, it, it was between Auburn and Georgia for the national title. Uh, like every, the yeah. entire time. And so if it wasn't Auburn winning, it was us winning. And um, for four years, you know, like I was kind of a thorn in David Marsh's side oh, yeah. um, at NCAAs every year. And like, no offense, but like we hated Auburn. Like you were our like arch, net, like you were our rival. And I think like my junior year, maybe my sophomore year, it was the first time we actually got to swim you guys in a dual meet. Like we hadn't swam a dual meet against right. you guys in a uh -huh. decade. And yeah. like, it, it was basically like NCAAs. Like we were like, all right, like let's go, like, let me at them. And, but like the, just the rivalry of like the blood between Georgia and Auburn, it like, it goes deep. And in 2012, you know, it's like, three months before Olympic trials and I was not swimming well. I was swimming for the Colorado stars in Denver, Colorado. And I was like, well, I can either retire right now, three months before trials, or um, I can try to go swim somewhere else because it's not happening where I'm at. And I had to like tuck my Georgia tail between my legs and call David Marsh and be like, <laughs> I didn't mean any of that stuff about, you know, like, is it okay if I come swim for you? And I mean, David's like such a, a nice guy. And he, he asked me some good questions. It was like, you know, like, and, and I knew it was a long shot. Like you guys had such a great, like core group together um, going into that trials and bringing somebody else in it can be disruptive, you know, and I didn't want to be disruptive. I, if I came, I only wanted to try to add to the environment that you guys had there. Um, and David is like, well, Kara, are you swimming to finish out your contract with Speedo or to just try to, you know, swim through trials or are you swimming to make the Olympic team in the 400 free relay? And I was like, I'm swimming to make the Olympic team in the 50 free, David. And he was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. that's, 
Yeah, that's well. Oh gosh, there's so many things that did. Um, so <laughs> why did why did you seek out the? So what was it about? Like when you're coming from Colorado, yeah. to David? Why? Oh man, well. I like to truly talk about my journey, like between 2008 to 2012, it it's like just so rocky. I mean, I left Georgia um, and I left on such good terms, but it was like, you know, I've gone to two Olympics with Jack and um, I want to try to like expand my knowledge. I want to grow. I want to become a better swimmer. I want to see what else is out there. And so I moved to Southern California and I trained with, um, fast in Fullerton and that lasted for just one year, um, without getting into any of those details. Um, I had to leave after one year and find another place to swim. And I was devastated. Hmm. And I remember it was like, you know, April, 2011 and everybody's like, Oh my gosh, like you're moving a year and three months before Olympic trials. Nobody does that. You're insane to do that. I'm like, why? Well, I don't have a choice. I don't have a team anymore. And so I ended up moving to Colorado and I saw with Missy Franklin and the experience of like living there and swimming, like hands down, just in, like, she's an incredible person. And anybody that's ever met her, like she is as good as like she comes off and, um, you know, she was like a sister to me. Um, but I progressively got slower and slower as that year went on. So between April, 2011 to April, 2012, I remember I went to a Grand Prix meet like in March and I, I made like the B or the C final in the 50 free. And I was like, what the heck am I doing? Like yeah. if I'm going to go crush um, a really slow 200 back, like I could probably do that right now because I'm doing Missy's practices, but I wasn't really getting, I think what I knew I needed. And, um, and it was just, it, it wasn't happening. And so I had to make a decision to leave and there really wasn't like, there's not a lot of options as a pro. And so um, when I called David, I was like, man, all my Georgia friends are going to kill me for this, but it's just <laughs> dire need. And, um, and, you know, you guys had Peter Bierhoff as the assistant coach and he was right. my teammate at Georgia um, and Peter's a great guy too. And so it, it felt kind of like coming home, like being able to see Peter every day. And I knew all of you guys that were already on the team, but um, yeah. So then I moved three months before Olympic trials and everyone's like, what is she doing? No one can like, how can you possibly do that? And I was like, well, I, you know, it's either that or I have to retire now. <laughs> so. I, I didn't expect that because I moved in January. Um, I think actually new year's day is when I came up there and um, it was a late move for me. And, uh, and I already had a relationship with David, but the, the conversation at the front end was obviously very similar it was like what yeah. are some of the motivations we want to make sure and he already knew me and my background and work work ethic and the influence that would have on the team and i think ultimately that's why he said like yes for sure come um and but like for you to come in that that late it was very late and for all of us <laughs> we didn't expect for that to happen i, I remember like walking in my first day at swim Mac and being like hi everybody like i'm the new kid I won't be disturbing any, like, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, well, I don't know. It's like I, earlier I said in the conversation, it's, it, to, I, I remember our, my time with you as part of that experience. And for, it was, for both of us, it was short. And for you, it was half of the time that I was spent there, but it was still like a huge impact. And I think that um, what, when you were sharing your story earlier about 2012 trials, um, that was my last swim meet. And I remember, uh, the lead up to that meet and you know i know you from your history in college swimming and and internationally etc um and then i got to train with you but i also was aware of the where you had come from in the last yeah. year too and so i mean candidly like i didn't think that you were going to make the team yeah and that's not a lack of belief in in you but it was just you know you kind of there's some people that are surprises and I honestly like, I didn't expect Colin to swim as well as he swam at that meet either. And he, did, and he lit it up yeah. at 2012 trials. So it's just, sometimes those things happen. And, um, you know, but, but it, it struck me at that meet that it's like, well, I actually, for both of you, that you're athletes that when you showed up in the big moment that, like it didn't matter, you know, like, so circumstances around different training environments, different coaches that you pick up and the journey that you go through, like that showcased to me the professionalism that you had and the elite um, level that you'd reached in the sport, both in how you approached it mentally, physically to like, 
you knew how to show up in a big moment. You knew how to get your hand on the wall in the right moment. And there's something that's yeah. like innate in, in you about that. And I just, I, I don't know. It was, I really admired that when I saw you make that team. I thank you. Um, like, you know, we talked about that's definitely my, my favorite race, but, um, oh, there's, there's so much I want to touch on, like with what you just said. Um, I think like when I called David three months before trials, had I, had I been getting progressively slower from 2011 to 2012, I would have been like, you know what, like, and, and, you know, and I didn't really care anymore. If I was kind of checked out, I would have stayed, I would have either, you know, just gone and, and, you know, done trials just to say I did it, or I would have retired. But, um, that year, like Brian, I was working so hard. It was like some of the, like, hardest practices and like throwing down times that I've never thrown down before. And so in the back of my head, I'm like, something's just not adding up because I know how hard I'm working. I know what I'm, what I'm putting down in practice. And like, there's just something that's off. And so going to swim for David, it's not like David had to whip me into shape. Um, I think mentally I was broken. Like I would walk into practice and he would be like, you are Carolyn Joyce, like every day. And he would like say that you're Carolyn in Joyce. I'm like, yeah, what does that mean? And he's like, everyone is scared of you. Like, you know, and he would like talk me up to myself and I'm like, oh, okay. Like, and, and that was probably like the biggest um, thing that changed was, um, you know, him like really instilling confidence back in me and, yeah. and reminding me like, you know, where I'd come from and, and things that I had done. But, um, you know, over the course of those three months, it definitely got better. And, um, and when I went to trials, I was like, you know, I really do think, I do think I have a chance. And, uh, and when Colin made it in the 50 free the night before, so the men's 50 free finals, the night before the women's 50 free final and Colin made it out of lane two. Yeah. And I had swum semifinals. I think I was like fifth. So I was in lane two the next night and I was like, Oh, like it's the lucky lane. And <laughs> so, yeah, that's awesome. Carolyn, I, I, I was going to make already stale funny dad joke about you being an actress who knows how to swim really well and how did you and you know how did you get that raging bull scenario to be just a good swimmer because i've touched the wall um so i'm not gonna go there because it's not a bad joke um but <laughs> but it's a nice segue because you know when it, nowadays when i mention your name to a couple of people like carolyn joyce i love her that's my favorite movie that's the best <laughs> And I know it's like, okay, I'm now known for my movie I made, but A, swimming needs to have more of that inspirational, like behind the scenes, like mm -hmm. stuff for our kids. Um, and, and you are the best role model and that relationship you had with Missy in that movie. I didn't see it, but I saw a lot of highlights and I, it, people love that for you. So you probably get more autographs or notoriety for that maybe now, but B, did that, I mean, did that help you with Lead Summit? Talk about Lead Summit and what drove you to Lead Summit and, and just being that really inspiration. You sound, you're very inspirational right now. Like talk about that, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, so moving to Denver, I mean, not only like training with Missy, but um, it was such a role reversal for me as an athlete. Um, you know, I, I grew up with two older brothers, like I'm the youngest and I'm the only girl. And so um, my entire childhood, it was like me with the boys, like yeah. not me with the boys my age, but me with the boys that are older than me. And I always kind of, I, and I, I, you know, I started college when I was 17. I'm, I'm also young for my grade. Um, so I have always felt like the, the youngest and, um, and I'm, I'm an introvert naturally. So I'm like the youngest and the quietest and like, don't worry about me. Like I'll be over here kind of doing my thing. Um, and that really, I felt like that carried through my career. And once I got to Colorado, um, I think I was 20, maybe like 24, 25 when I moved there, 25. Um, I, I was 25 years old swimming with a, a high school club team. Yeah. And the next oldest person on the team was like 16 or 17 years old. And it took me probably like within two weeks of hearing the high school kids say back some of the things that they'd heard me say in practice. And I was like, oh, I like, <laughs> I, was like okay, I need to, I need to take this role seriously um, because I know I'm a role model to them. And the things that I say and, and the things that they see me do and my actions are going to be mirrored by these kids. And it was, um, it was really important to me to set a good example for them and for Missy. 
And so um, I think that like really much later in my career, um, having that role flip and, and understanding just how important that was, uh, because I had that my whole life, you know, other people were that to me. And this was like my opportunity to be that Tom Malchow to, um, you know, a 15 or 16 year old girl. And, um, and then, you know, touch the wall happened. And yeah. I remember, so like I moved to Colorado and, and it's like, you know, a year and three months before the Olympics. And it was um, the summer before, it was the summer leading into Missy's um, like five gold medals at Worlds, I think, um, in China. So in 2011, um, World Championships in Shanghai, Missy like, you know, exploded yeah. on the scene, but a lot of people kind of smelled it coming. And at practice, almost every day, it would be like Chicago Tribune, New York Times, like wow. whatever media you can imagine leading into um, World Championships. Mm -hmm. And um, this one day, these two guys with cameras walk in and they're setting up and I'm like, Oh, like Missy, who, who's here for you today? Who's, um, who's the media for you? And, um, she's like 15 and she's got braces and she's kind of embarrassed. And she's like, um, it's these guys. And they're kind of like making a movie about me. Um, like no big deal. And I was like, Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Good for you. And so then, you know, Missy and I swim practice and we're both six feet tall and we look alike and we're like dominating these other little kids. And, um, you know, going head to head the whole time. And these guys are filming it. And <laughs> I remember um, after that practice, I'm like putting my stuff in my equipment bag and, and they walk over to me and they're like, who the hell are you? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm the new kid. Hi. <laughs> yeah, we heard. Uh, can we come talk to you? Um, Want to, you know, talk about Missy and, and, you know, tell you about what we're doing. So they came to my house that day and we talked for like three hours. And um, yeah. at the end, they're like, do you want to be in our movie? And I'm like, um, it, you know, it's a movie about swimming, like probably something like, you know, maybe just my best friend would watch, like, I guess like it's cute, you know, whatever. Like did, I really didn't think it would come amount to anything. Cause I've like heard of movies and swimming getting made. And, um, I mean, they certainly followed through and it was on Netflix. I mean, touch the wall has been seen literally millions of times, yeah. which okay. blows my mind. And, had I known that while it was being filmed, I would have chosen different outfits. I would have like <laughs> said things probably more poignantly, and um, you know, like I just had no idea that it would amount to anything at all. And it changed my life for sure. Um, and the dynamic that Missy and I have throughout that movie, I'm her mentor. I'm her big sister. And that I would say definitely positioned me. I mean, Touch the Wall came out in 2014, and. Um, I'd been retired for two years by then, and it kind of like pulled me back into um, the swimming sphere in a different light than I'd ever been there before. And um, in 2016, I started to kind of mull around the idea. You know, I'd been teaching at swim labs, um, teaching private lessons, and the demographic that I was working with was almost exclusively teenage girls. And there was like this long wait list to get in for a lesson, like six, eight, nine months wow. to get in for a lesson with me, and which is silly, very flattering. But, um, I remember being like, gosh, I wish that there was something that I could send my entire wait list of girls to where they could get these things. Cause it's, they, they would come in devastated from, you know, uh, their championship meet or they'd come in really nervous or just like, you know, kind of at the end of their rope and in, in their swimming career, like, you know, bored. you turn 14, 15, everything changes the solution to their problems it was never like oh well like obviously you know your hip position is just 15 degrees off and that's why you're swimming like you know a little bit slow right now it was never about their technique it was always about the other stuff like their yeah, confidence um their mental health you know what whatever else is going on in their lives and i would make that connection with them and i was like man i just wish i could send these girls somewhere so that they're not waiting months and months for this this help that they need and so i went looking for some kind of retreat or camp or summit or something that existed and I couldn't find it. Um, so that led me to start the lead sports summit. And so our first event was in 2017. Um, we held it in Austin, Texas, and we brought in Missy Franklin and Elizabeth Beisel. Um, Madison Cox was there. And then um, some experts in leadership, sports psychology and, um, and mental health. And it was like, it far exceeded my expectations. It was incredible. And um, this year would have been our fourth. We did postpone this year, um, uh, because of coronavirus. And, um, but I mean, we still, we are, I'm doing like my dream job that I didn't even know was possible. I've never, you know, like it, it kind of like built this 
thing really organically. And um, I pinch myself daily that I'm an influence on teenage girls like me. I, I have that privilege. And um, I, I, again, I, I don't take it lightly. And so um, we have our yearly summit. And then about two weeks ago, we launched our online academy, um, which <laughs> we started doing about a year and a half ago, we started to have the conversation because our summit fills up in a couple weeks every year. Wow. Like by January, it's completely full and we don't host it until September. And so we grow this long wait list every year. And I come run into the same problem where I'm like, I wish I could do something more for this group of girls that can't get into our event because it's full. We physically can't take more people. Mm -hmm. And so about a year and a half ago, we started the process of having the conversation, like what would an online academy look like? How could we serve this demographic? Yeah. And in April of 2019, we recorded um, three online courses in confidence, leadership, and sports psychology. Mm -hmm. And we launched them two weeks ago. Like I- Oh, kudos. In wow. January, yeah, but in January, we're like, how are we gonna convince people that online learning is like a really you know, necessary thing? And like, are, are they gonna even like understand mm -hmm. how to use like, you know, like an online academy and like doing Zoom calls? Are kids gonna know how to do Zoom? And then all of this stuff happens and we're like, Oh, oh my gosh. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I like to see this as like, you know, for my business in particular, since we are a live in-person events business in sports, which are all things that don't exist currently. I like to see this as, you know, our silver lining that, um, you know, it's given us a little bit of a jump start, I think on our platform, but, um, Ultimately, it's just something that we're going to continue to grow. We're in pre-production for our next set of courses and nutrition and, and some other stuff that we're working on. And, you know, we want to be a resource for female athletes and their parents and coaches. And it's not just for swimmers. It's our online academies for all female athletes. So I, I, you, you, there's, I could talk two hours with you about this stuff. Um, there are two questions I want. There are two bits of advice I'd love to hear from you. One, let's go back to the first part where you're talking about um, Amy Bill Chris was on the show. And Amy's right now training with an age group team in Tucson. And um, and she said one of the things that she's gaining from them is gaining to love the sport of swimming again, seeing that passion and that this raw, let's race, let's get down there, summer team, let's race. And she's enjoying that, you know, after going through what 15, she said injuries in her leg, etc. So that's so, and then I have a number of, of of people from the Caribbean who are looking for a place to swim. And end up being 27 year old and swimming with age groupers in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now I swim with these young kids, Brian and John, right now, and I I, I try to get from them. No, <laughs> no, but seriously, what I I say, what advice could you get to give to these athletes who are in environments that are different to them and that you took out of that environment with Todd? One, and then two, um, you know, our next show is on Saturday, I believe, guys, at 4 p.m. with Coach Kristen, and um. You have my Kristen on? Yeah, and we're really looking forward to that. So I would love to like, you know, what are, what are some of the topics that one should talk about? Not not just, um, you know, one should be aware of them, should talk about. So talk about the two bits of advice you have for us. Yeah, I actually didn't know that Amy was training with the club team, but um, I can definitely understand. Um, so when I, you know, when I started swimming with Missy, people were like, you're going to go swim with a teenager, Kara? Like, yeah. What are you doing? And I'm like, no, she's really good. Like, I swear. Um, <laughs> but I, I got to see the sport like through her eyes where she was experiencing uh, everything for the first time. Yeah. You know, she had not made the Olympic team yet yeah. and getting her team USA gear or, yeah. um, you know, us going to China for world championships together. That was like a great experience that we both had together. And her asking me a million questions. I mean, Missy, <laughs> Before she got her license, I drove her to practice. We would work out in the weight room together uh, three days a week. And then I would drive her like 30 minutes to practice. And she had two presets in my car. Um, with, like American top 40 and then country hits or something like that. <laughs> and, but it was, it was a great time. Like we just got to like talk to each other and I tell me about what's going on in high school. Tell me about your like French exam or whatever. And um, whatever Missy got out of it, I think it was tenfold for me just mm -hmm. it like refreshed my love for the sport and everything was exciting again and everything was really cool again and um and so i as weird as it can sound i think for an older athlete to make that move i i do think there's so much value in it and um i think it's really cool that she's doing that and then what was your other question was it about Kristen? yeah just what topics would you like 
there to be discussed in the general forum, not just for the specific audience, but what should we be talking about as a swimming community at large? Um, you know, gosh, Kristen is, uh, and Brian, you probably know her from Swim Mac. Was she, did you guys overlap at all? So, all right, now that you say that, now I'm wondering, because I, I didn't recall that. Well, uh, if you got, I guess if you got there at the new year, she might have not been there um, still. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Well, um, oh no, she was after us. Kristen was at Swim Mac. Okay the next quadrennial. Oh, okay. um, but so Kristen is like a unicorn in, in this sport. Um, she is a professional confidence coach. She's mm. not a psychologist. She's not a psychiatrist. Like she is a professional confidence coach and her knowledge and experience and ability to like get things out of teenage girls is she has such a gift and she's so captivating. Like you watch her speak and it's, it's incredible. Um, but you know, she, we recorded, um, an online confidence course. It's eight modules and, um, it is like, I think men should watch it. I mean, it's for teenage girls and, and coaches and stuff, but I, I definitely think that boys should watch it. I think male coaches, I think dads should watch it. Um, it's so good. And she's an incredible, orator. Um, I know her brother is a preacher. And so like you watch it and you're like, I want to know what's happening next. I want to know what she's going to say next. And she just has that like really great superpower. But um, mm. her talks at our event at our lead summit are um, definitely the most popular and, and the most transformative for the girls that attend. That's so outstanding. You guys will ask her questions. You'll, you'll see. No, well, we're very excited to talk to her. Yeah. Um, and I think that I have such respect for what the work that you are doing with her. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's really great. Uh, okay, so we did have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, we're going to bring right. Justin in to share some of uh, the questions that we heard today. Yeah, Kara, you talked about those on the online learning. Where can you find that online learning? Thank you, Justin. Um, it's leadsportsacademy.com, L E A D lead sports academy.com. Um, you can find right now it's the confidence course. Um, the next course launches in eight weeks, but, um, the confidence course. So Kristen's actually doing weekly live sessions with everybody that's, um, enrolled in the confidence course. And that starts on Sunday, June 7th. So in like three days, um, wow. and she'll probably talk about that on Saturday, but, Great. um, so if you're going to get it, I would definitely enroll as soon as possible and, and hop in those zoom classes. Cause you're going to be able to ask questions. It's going to be like super cool and casual and stuff, but, um, just a nice dialogue for Kristen to have with everybody that's taking the course lead sports Cool. Um, we got a question from a Ronald hen. He asked Kara clearly has a great aerobic base, amazing endurance workout. Did you find any particular sprint workouts to be as difficult or more as some of the significant distance sets? <laughs> Tough question. <laughs> no, like we are all sprinted, by the way. So answer correctly. All of us sprint. <laughs> all fifty freestylers. Okay, well, like, no, not, not me. Not me. Well, sprint sets are really hard. Like I never threw up doing a middle distance or distance set, but I would throw up doing sprint sets. See. That lactic acid. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> <Mind> drop. <laughs> All right. Our next question is from a critique. I hope I'm saying that right. Sorry if I butchered your name. How does one rebound from a disappointing race and not let the race ruin the rest of your meet? Um, yeah, good question. So um, back to like me in the ready room at Olympic trials. I, one of the other things that was like, poor me, poor me was that, um, I swim the hundred at trials and I think I got like 22nd place. So I didn't even semifinal in the hundred free at trials. Like I've won that event at trials before. I didn't even semifinal this time. And I was like, well, shucks, like, I guess I can call it a meet or I can just kind of reevaluate. And, um, one bad swim doesn't determine the rest of your swims. It's definitely a drag in the moment, but, um, you know, like whatever. I, I've seen people that, you know, maybe their best event is the hundred fly and they swim that the first day of the meet and they, um, they don't do well in the hundred fly, but then they swim the, you know, 200 free the next day and they go like crazy best times. And I, I don't know. I tapering is like a finicky, <clears throat> a finicky thing. Like your taper could like really be on for the 50 free and then like off for everything else or yeah. Keeper could randomly hit for like your 200 free and you're like, I had no idea I even had that swim in me today, but I guess the taper gods are, you know, playing a trick on me. 
<clears throat> um, but yeah, one swim doesn't determine the rest of the meet for sure. And there, every time you step up, there's always a, a possibility. Mm -hmm. Final question from a Lydia Gordon, would you consider coming to Jamaica to do a swim clinic? Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> we do it. That sure sounds like a All pretty right. nice time. Awesome. And by the way, if you go to Jamaica for a swim clinic, we will join you. Maybe yes, Jamaica. <laughs> I swam in many a meeting um in Jamaica. Some at their Commonwealth pool because Commonwealth Games were held there, and they got a Commonwealth Games um pool down there. It's it's great. It's very Let's hot. Let's do it. Must be nice. Yeah. Well, we got to go somewhere else in the Caribbean. We did do a clinic in Trinidad. That was super fun. <laughs> Um, all right. So Kara, we're going to close. We got a couple rapid fire questions for you, actually more than a couple. Uh, but first thing that comes to mind, you ready? <clears throat> What's the hardest race in swimming? Tune her back. What's the best summer league swim meet snack? Uh, I never swam summer league. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, <fail. clears throat> thoughts. Let's go. <laughs> how old, how old? <laughs> How old were you when you were officially faster than your brothers? Um, you know, I could beat them in practice. So my my <laughs> always above me, um, Kevin. He 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 went twenty point in his fifty free. I went twenty one. So never faster than him. And then Sean, my oldest brother, was a distance swimmer, and so I never went like four twenty something in the five hundred. Unfortunately, that's legit. Uh, well, if you pulled it, maybe you would have. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's the best movie to watch on a team bus trip? Touch the wall. <laughs> what's the all time, your all time favorite pool to race in? Um, the old Tennessee pool. Oh, the old, I hated that. Where you stand on the blocks and you have to like duck because they had, the they had <laughs> yeah. we oh, the that. there. Uh, what's the funniest thing Jack or Harv ever said to you? Uh, it's, it's not PG-13 rated. <laughs> is this PG-13? <laughs> <laughs> it a second ago. It's all yeah, I cursed nonstop. Sorry. <laughs> What's the bigger swim fashion faux pas? Goggles around the neck or square butt pulling your suit too far down? Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go a different direction here. I think the biggest faux pas, and like every time I see it, I'm like, girl, let me help you, is when um Girls wear like a really high bun and then they put their cap over the high bun and then their goggles go below the bun. Oh. Like that, above, you can't have like this here and that. No, no, no. So I think it's that. I know exactly what you're talking about. Never bothered me. But Doesn't no. have the where his goggles around his neck works for him. <laughs> <laughs> if he could start an ISL franchise, what would you call it? Oh, uh, ooh. Um, I don't know. That's actually. <laughs> I'm so like behind on this ISL thing. I need to do more homework on it. Um, you got the energy. You got the. Um, I think I failed this question already. You, uh, you failed. Sure did. Right. Energy <laughs> standard is a name, not energy. <laughs> energy would maybe be better, <laughs> but energy <laughs> standard. Why go the energy? Why would the EVA pull the coldest pull on earth? Yeah, yeah, I, that's a great question. And I got some beef with Jack still to this day. Yeah, cool. I, I hated it. Last year, we saw a 20 point uh, on the women's side. And uh, I'm wondering how much longer until the first woman goes 19 in the 50 free short course? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I was actually there when she did that. Um, cool. uh, maybe another decade. Yeah, I think it's gonna be quick. We skipped over eighteen real. I mean, we we went from eighteen to seventeen real fast on the yeah. men's side. So I just I don't want to count it out. It's coming. Like soon. a little part of me dies, like when I see the American record is like twenty point now, and I'm like, oh, like these poor people. It was at one point twenty one six, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so you met Summer Sanders at your first Olympic trials, and that made an impact on you. Now you have this platform and you're impacting so many young women. Um, is there anybody who's a current swimmer today that you feel like you may have been uh, like a huge impact to them the way that summer was to you? Um, that's a good question. Um, we have a lot of girls that, that walk through our door um, and a lot of girls that I particularly am close with and mentor. Um, so at our first lead summit in 2017, 
It's supposed to be for girls um, 13 to 18. And I, I want to say she was 12 at the time, but I was at a clinic and um, our event hadn't filled up yet. And I, I saw her and I was like, you need to come to the lead sports summit this year. And she taught lessons all summer and um, bought herself a ticket and came and it's Claire Tuggle. And at the time, I think Claire was like 12 going like a 144 and her 200 free or something like that. Wow. Um, and I, you know, I still keep in touch with Claire and I think she's like super, I think she's a super badass. I think she's amazing. I'm like, Did I say that? Yes. Hell yes. Um, I, I love that girl. And, um, and, the, but there's a lot of like really good fast, like, look at the Walsh sisters. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Like, they're so good. And, um, you know, this is like kind of selfish, but when the Olympics got canceled, obviously like it, or postponed, it needed to happen. And, and it's terrible, you know, what happened with the virus and, and, everybody's mourning different things. And I was like, I'm, I'm mourning not getting to watch swimming this summer. Like I'm really, I look forward to it. Like I get to nerd out for the eight days of trials, the eight days of the Olympics. Like I'm like sad. I don't have that memory to like leave 2020 with, but mm -hmm. you know, one more year. We are here, and I'm willing to bet that Claire is not the only one. Um, there's going to be many, many, many that are impacted sure. by you. Yeah. I just going to say that we learned that you're a badass puller. You can, <laughs> Pull five four thousand yards holding under a minute and cruise a one fifty seven cruise. Um, you don't like kicking, but what was the favorite part of your workout? Was it social kick? Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, social kick for sure is the best part of workout. Um, but we were talking a little bit before, and it's actually funny like this is called social kick. And like Brian, do you remember when we were social kicking together? Like I didn't even like take into account the name of the the podcast, but, um, when we were on swim Mac and, um, I was like really bored, you know, like nobody's going out three months before trials. Like everybody has to like hunker down and, and be really behaved. And, um, and I was reading like the 50 shades of gray trilogy and like you and Davis, every social kick would come up, like flank me on either side. Of me, hey, Karen, tell us about your chapter last night. What are you like? Tell us about what happened. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm glad you asked. And I'm like, oh, like, story. I hope that that doesn't come up in your summit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, these, are, these are the things. Carolyn, this has been awesome. Uh, it was fun to catch up. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much for being on. Where can people follow you? Yeah. Um, you can follow me on the social channels. I'm just at Carolyn Joyce. I'm not super active on there. Uh, I try to be better, but um, you know, the Lead Sports Summit is at Lead Sports Summit and all the social channels, and that's a much better follow than me. I can guarantee it. <laughs> uh, well, um, we're looking forward to watching the work that you do there. And thanks so much. It's fun conversation. That's it for the Social Kick Podcast. Yeah, uh, we'll see you again on Saturday. And thanks a lot. See ya. Thanks, guy.